I'm Lisa Bontesumi, and this is the Ath Mindset podcast series on Sports Epreneur. This podcast series is a space for conversations with athletes, coaches, practitioners, and stakeholders in sports. And it's where those individuals share their perspectives, experiences, and thoughts on mental health in sports. Eric Kazimoff of Sports Epreneur is generously hosting the Ath Mindset podcast series on his platform as he deeply believes that these conversations are essential and deserve to be prioritized. This is the Ath Mindset podcast series on Sports Epreneur. Sports Epreneur, the content platform where sports, entrepreneurship, and mental health collide. If you are looking to start a podcast or create original content, you have to talk with the team at Sports Epreneur. I work with them and I vouch for them. It's that simple. Go to sportse.io to learn more. What's up, Alexis? How are you? What's I'm going great. On? Hey, doing great. Just I uh, got a couple of weeks left until I head down to Memphis to start the practice. So just I enjoying my time. Know. No, that's awesome. You've been enjoying your time too up to now. Yes. So <laughs> speaking of Memphis, you know, Alexis Kent plays for the Memphis Americans. She's a professional footballer, professional soccer player, whatever you want to call it, depending on where you are in this world. But like, I know you haven't always been. There's been a journey, just like most professional athletes to get here. Like, tell us about that. How old were you when you first started playing? And what was that experience like growing up? Sure. So I grew up in a very small town. So you kind of, you did everything. And sports was sort of what I guess just had a knack for. So I, I mean, I played everything like roller hockey, basketball, softball, whatever. Just, I kind of always joke that that's all I'm good at is just sports. But growing up in Indiana, I actually wanted to play basketball and I thought that's what I was going to do. I wanted to go play at UConn or maybe Tennessee. And that's, that's where I thought I was going to go. And then it, basketball ended up not being my future. I had a big growth spurt in sixth grade and then I stopped. So that was kind of it for basketball. But soccer, I just kind of kept doing it. I kind of, I didn't realize that I was pretty decent at it. It was just something I did and enjoyed. And I got to meet a lot of people through it, especially when I went to college. Uh, I went to Purdue. And I had no idea what club was like. We didn't have academies uh-huh. and real club soccer when I was growing up and uh-huh. even in high school. We didn't have it. And I I just assumed if you went to you know North Carolina or Notre Dame or UCLA, then you went to the national team and that was it. Like there was no in between. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand the whole international game. And I didn't realize there were so many different levels and clubs within even just the US. So I kind of just got into working right after college and I randomly stumbled upon a coach for a WPSL team and also an assistant for the Haitian national team when I was visiting Purdue again after I graduated. And just we got to talking and I was like, I want to play for Chile. Like I just didn't know it was an option, but I want to. And I was kind of sold on the idea that that would be a possibility via playing with the the Haitian team and the WPSL team. So I kind of just stumbled upon it. I am not one that grew up necessarily with the aspirations of being a professional soccer player. Because again, I, I didn't really know it was a possibility, but it just kind of started happening. And then things just... I just kept meeting new people and kind of gaining new opportunities through that. And once I started kind of having my first like contract we'll call it. And I only put it in quotes just because, you know, semi-pro women's soccer is sometimes a hobby. Right. <laughs> or you pay to play, right? Uh, yeah. And and thankfully, we did get a little bit. We're It's kind of more you're paid for. Sometimes you get a little bit of money. Sometimes you get housing. Sometimes you just get gear. Mm-hmm. And it's like mm-hmm. you could play. You're not going to get anything, but you don't have to pay anything. Either. Gotcha. So it mm-hmm. kind of depends on those teams. But that, that even happens in, in NWSL. Mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So I had a trial with the Red Stars. And they said, if you don't have... I guess I don't know if I can say this, but if you don't have housing, we're not sure we can... Just like keep that in mind, you know, yeah. if you become part of the team. Yeah. Yeah. Well, every team has their budget, right? Every league has their budget. So, I mean, that's the reality. I don't think a lot of people know that. But you said you kind of stumbled into it. I mean... What I know about you is that you don't stumble into anything. You go get it. I mean, like you reach out, 
you build networks, you build relationships, and then you nurture them. And that's what I know about you. So I don't think anyone stumbles into playing any professional sport. So I just want to give you your, as I say, flowers and your credit for like all of the initiation and perseverance that you've taken to get to where you are. I mean, you were interested in playing for the Chilean national team. Why that team? So I was born there. My sister and I were born in Chile. We were adopted. So we did grow up in the United States. And everything was it was very open, transparent. You know, we knew everything that had happened. You know, there was never any secret or any, I don't want to say dysfunction, but everything was just always very clear to mm-hmm. my sister and I. And it wasn't until I think middle school when I kind of started wanting to talk about it more and mm-hmm. get into, you know, like I am different. I am from somewhere else. You know, I am this like little Hispanic kid in a in a very like kind of German white community. And I didn't really feel ostracized by my friends, but you could tell that they just, no one knows anything about anything outside of just like Indiana. Yeah. So it was hard for me to kind of find information. You know, we didn't have Google and I didn't know who to talk to about it. And middle school is also where, you know, especially in sports, you know, people start taunting and bantering. And I heard my own teammates say some things about, you know, other people and other races. And then it started happening to me from other mm. teams where they just start calling me things. And it's like, are they just trying to find something that they feel is hurtful? Mm-hmm. And that's just what they chose. Because in a small kind of small town, Indiana, I, it's not super obvious that I'm from somewhere else. And part of that is just because I did grow up in a white family and everyone knows my family in this town. So, and they know that they're from there. So it's not super obvious until I you know, left and then people could kind of visually see that maybe I am from somewhere else. But I do remember it was a basketball game and I, I got called like a Mexican, hmm. I think, for you know the other team. And someone threw the N-word at me and I was like, what is your goal? Like, then it was seventh grade. It was, it's not like it was so heated and so passionate. And I got so upset and I pulled myself off because I told my coach, because I didn't know what was happening. I was just so confused and so yeah. bothered and so like yeah. disappointed, sad. I, you know, I don't know. Because I, at the same time, I put everything I have into my athletics. So I am already at a vulnerable state because I'm just like going so hard, even though I just said it's seventh grade basketball. But I pulled myself off because she was like, you're fine, you're fine. Because like I didn't have time to explain what just happened. I just sat down on the bench and they were upset for a moment because they didn't know why I was doing it. And I told people afterwards and they didn't really know what to say, I guess. They hadn't experienced it themselves and it's just... They don't see a lot of it that happens in our small town. You know, I wouldn't say that where I grew up, they're they're not really very rude or intentionally ignorant, but they just don't know. Yeah. They don't know what they don't know. And in yeah. a small town environment like that, you're not put in a position to need to know. Yeah. Because everybody's homogeneous, everybody's the same, everybody has the same sort of outlook, the same mindset. That's kind of like small town privilege or like white small mm-hmm. town privilege, you don't need to go outside your comfort zone to understand until someone comes into your community who's different, like you. And then they yeah. don't know the harm that they're causing. I think too, developmentally at that age, preteen, tweens, as I call them, like they don't know the harm. They're impulsive. like, mm-hmm. And they try to find ways to dig at each other without knowing the impact. Yeah. But you expressed it really clearly. You know, you were disappointed, hurt, confused. And then unfortunately, the adults weren't equipped to help support that because they've probably never been in that situation before. But yeah. yeah. But I'm sure that you've built a lot of resilience as a result. I mean, our experiences define us, right? Like, Mm -hmm. how would you explain how you've grown from there? Like, how have you come to understand yourself as a woman of colors in a white community playing in a sport that might not represent you sometimes or people might not understand you? Like, how have you come to kind of find your rhythm there? It took a really long time. Even starting in middle school and a little bit high school and college, you start to kind of experience those similar things. I had never had anything too traumatic, I guess, especially in college was fine because I, you know, I did go to Purdue. So then I mm-hmm. get to be around a ton of people. Like it really opened up my eyes to where mm-hmm. I was like, man, like, people come from everywhere to the school mm-hmm. and it was great. And I never wanted to go back home mm-hmm. because it just felt nice. And, you know, and people, 
They acknowledge the different backgrounds. They acknowledge different ethnicities and they just go with it. Because, you know, people say like, oh, I don't see color. It's like, we want you to see it, but just for your understanding and kind of recognition, not for any purposes of treating people a certain way. But anyway, I guess I don't think it was till after, after college and starting getting into where I was playing for somewhat of a living where I started to put a little bit more emphasis on me as the soccer player. And then when I got with the Haitian national team, and that's, I still wanted to keep that goal of mine to play for the Chilean team in mind. But I also just had to immerse myself in a completely new culture. I had no former knowledge of anything about Haiti. You hear a little bit about it. You just hear they're poor and that's it. And getting to be just with like, you're living, I was living with these girls, you know, I'm around them 24, seven, six, eight months out of the year. I was there for two years and they were in the United States. This is actually in Indiana. Okay. They had lost their coach in the earthquake in 2010. And so mm. one of the coaches in the US actually took over the team. So I did get to be comfortable in my own environment at the same time. But I'm learning French and Creole at the same time. Right. And I right. wanted to learn French because that's a language that people recognize. But then at the same time on the field, it's fast. And I'm like, whatever you speak on the field, that's what I want to learn. Uh-huh, because uh-huh. then I can use it with you guys and I can understand it. And they're like, well, Creole is what comes to us more naturally. So uh-huh. then I learned Creole, which was great for that time period. And it's neat if I ever run into Haitian people because they have no idea that I would know how to speak it. But it's not very practical at all like French would have been. But I kind of have to stop learning about myself and my own experiences because I'm trying to figure out theirs and how to almost... I have to... It's easier for me to mold into their environment and their world than for me to try and get them to understand all this English and how to operate... Well, that's a perspective. I mean, Alexis, that's a perspective. Not everyone holds that same perspective as you do. Yeah. There's a lot of people who like want everyone to adapt to them and understand them and like shift to change to like communicate with me. Mm -hmm. But there's a humility and understanding and a openness that you have to understand that you are in their world and you are going to learn their world, their language, their culture, that wouldn't work for a lot of people. It's hard. (laughs) Yeah, it's an effort. It's an effort and it's work and it's uncomfortable. And Mm -hmm. you still went with it and probably learned a lot. That's so awesome. I mean, you're trilingual. What's the word? Quadlingual? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm comfortable. Almost proficient, I would say Spanish. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Mildly comfortable. I'm out of with Creole. I have any time if I make a Haitian friend, even if they're Haitian American and they don't really speak it, I will try and speak some just so I can keep up with it. Yes. And the girls, you know, this, is, mm-hmm. this was like 2013, 2014, 2015. And if I ever talk to any of the girls now, they are just over the moon if I can respond Aww. in Creole. <laughs> so <laughs> because, amazing. Yeah. I mean, another piece of the beautiful game, right, that soccer can give us is making these relationships, learning new cultures, Mm -hmm. learning new languages, ways of being, friendships. What I know about about you too, like you will keep those up. Like you will stay connected. Yeah. I mean, it's great. It's awesome. I mean, there's so many beauties and benefits of soccer than the obvious ones. And I think, you know, those are important to mention. I mean, being a professional soccer player is one of your identities. How would you describe your other identities and how do they show up for you in your world? I think that's tough because I think I've tried to make soccer be so much a part of my life for so long because I love it. I've always wanted to have it be part of my career, whether I was playing or just something that I would get to be involved with. And I guess, honestly, it's hard to think of myself without it being at least a part of something. And I know that that doesn't encompass everything that I am or that I do. But I don't know. I think I've kind of always been like a natural coach on Mm. when I play. So I kind of bring that aspect to even just my friendships and and relationships with people in general that I, I feel like I'm always 
looking out for how they can best do them. And I I think we talked about this too. I found out that I was empathic in 2020. Mm -hmm. So that also explains a lot of where I am this way, but it comes off... Well, tell us what that means, Alexis. How do you define empathic? Yes, we did talk about this. What does that mean to you? For me, how it kind of comes off is that I literally feel how other people feel. Because empathy, you know, is being able to understand other people's feelings, but I will physically feel it. So if there are people around me going through something, even if they're not talking about it, and even if they're not expressing it in their just nonverbal cues, I will feel it. And I will start to be sad about something. And I can't always decipher, am I sad or am I sad for somebody else? Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of it. That's kind of messed with me a lot in a positive Mm -hmm. way. Another part is that I know how people want to receive information. So I can usually... So if two people are talking and they're not getting on the same page, I can easily take what they're saying, give it to them, how that person will receive it without changing the meaning. So Uh, almost like a mediator or facilitator, like translator even. Yeah. And I've learned when I was working for a startup the last few years, I've, I've learned that that strength gives me the ability to do a lot of like community engagement and what we call gauging the temperature of the locker room. Being able mm-hmm. to, you know, if we're going to come out with a, a new product or new information or, or have to change part of the system of our, our company, how can we express it to people that shows them just the benefits and not that we're just changing to change, that we have a reason behind it and that their best interests are a part of that. So with a lot of that comes narcissism for a long time. Like, no, I was like, I'm conflicted on how narcissistic I think that I am. Because I, th- I I do think I am in some cases. But it comes from me knowing how other people feel. So when I give an idea or I feel very strongly about something, it's because I've already thought about how the receiver wants to have that information or that argument displayed or how it's going to benefit more people Then it can also come if I'm talking with someone one-on-one, I can kind of almost... And this is going to sound really, really weird. But like I can almost manipulate them. But in a way of... I can get them to see the positives or the best outcome for themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Like I can help mm -hmm. them get there. So it's a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And it's also a very draining, very draining Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think narcissistic, I mean, there's lots of different ways we can define that. There's a clinical definition. There's, but what is it that when you say narcissistic, what do you mean by that? I don't think that I'm just so much better than everyone. I usually Mm -hmm. feel like I'm right. But it does, again, come from a very fast but thorough analysis of the two sides of a situation. Well, that sounds to me like confidence. That too. That too. There's always that fine line between being confident and cocky too, right? So I think there's yes. just like how you use it. A lot of people say like, exactly. you know, LeBron is so cocky. And I'm like, or Zlatan, maybe that's a really good example too. Everyone, like he literally thinks he's the best, but that's, he just is, you know, he's not trying to act like anything. That's just how it is. And it's like, it, how negative does that come across? Because he performs at a very high level all the time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Confident in himself. I think that there's a, in the layman culture of our United States, like narcissism is, has a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. So if we were to flow with that, like to like flip it on its head, like, I don't see you as a narcissist. I see you as like a bridge builder. I see you as a facilitator. I see you as bringing people together. I see you as someone who is helping others discover themselves within themselves and all for good. A narcissist doesn't care if it's for good, but you care. Yeah. So you're doing it for good in that general term, whatever that situation might be. So people like you make good therapists. <laughs> Thought about and, it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we can I talk feel like I do that for free. Yes. Well, <laughs> we can make it so it's not for free. But anyway, that's a whole nother podcast right there. Interview. <laughs> what I mean... But what you're talking about, I mean, you started off answering my question like when I asked what other identities do you have and you weren't totally sure. I think that makes a lot of sense for any professional athlete in any sport that puts so much of themselves into it. 
Like mm-hmm. there's no way to really even afford to acknowledge you have other identities. But for you, I mean, you're a woman, you're a sister, you're a daughter, mm-hmm. you're a Chilean, you're a mental health advocate, you are a coach, you're mm-hmm. empathetic, you're a bridge builder. So these identities don't need to be formal. I mean, and we're not even talking about all the work that you've done, paid work or career or jobs that you've done that also help identify you and bring experience forward. So I think it's important for everyone to hear that any pro athlete in any sport is, especially a woman, is more than their sport and that there are lots of identities that you have. And sometimes it's just taking a moment to stop and identify them and realize like, oh yeah, that doesn't have to be a big deal. It's simple. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you're impacting people, like you say, in the locker room as a leader on the field, a leader in your work, but you've recently shifted from that startup. Tell us a little bit about that story and how that happened. Yeah. So I worked for Sphere uh, the last three years. And of course, soccer-based. It's a soccer-inspired fitness concept. It was actually founded by Mike Chabala. He was uh, in the MLS for... He doesn't get mad. I can't remember. I think he was maybe like 10 to 12 years that he was in, I think. But mostly with the Houston Dynamo. So he's kind of formed his home there. And I worked there. We got connected and it was right after I came back from Chile. So I spent about a year there playing and I had no idea what I wanted to do. It's like, you don't want to say you're done. But I had kind of thought about some sort of fitness and soccer marriage that I'm like, well, I'm good at both of those things. So how can I make it work? And he had kind of already created something like that. His career had ended a little bit before mine. So he had already had it figured out. And so I moved down there to do that. And briefly, you know, I was there for three years, did business development, a little bit of marketing and social. And it's a startup. So I kind of did whatever. And it's the same that I say I'm on the field. I'm really good at almost every position. I'm just not like the best at any one of those. Mm -hmm. So pros and cons. But I did decide to move on from there a couple of months ago. And I had... Let's see. That was, I guess, in the fall. So I knew I would have a little bit of time before I go to Memphis. And I had recently just heard about Chicago House the team in Nisa and then Oakland Roots. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Idris about this. When I first heard about Oakland Roots, I actually thought it was like a soccer enthusiast community concept. Mm. Like I didn't know about the team at first, Mm. which I don't think is a bad thing because honestly, Uh you know, it's community first, soccer second, which I love. And I was like, that's really cool. I want to go experience that. There's not a lot of other organizations that operate that way. And so I planned to go out there. And it wasn't until I got there that I was like, I'm not really doing anything right now that's like, I have to answer to anyone. So this is my time to experiment and try different things. And I love learning about people and finding ways to tell stories. I've always done fun video things. I write a lot. So I was like, why not just try and put together something for this team and my experiences here? Thankfully, I was able to connect with you as well. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I just got to fully immerse myself into a new community, a soccer community, and people who weren't even soccer fans originally who kind of fell in love with the sport Mm -hmm. via Oakland Mm Roots. And I think that's fantastic because I kind of got the idea originally. I had met Ethan White. He used to play in the MLS as well. Mm -hmm. I met him in Paris for the World Cup. And... He got a job in Italy and he basically gets to kind of document how Italian soccer culture is formed and how it's married with just the community that he's been in the team that he works for. And I was like, that is so beautiful. Like he just gets to experience the people and the things. And again, even people who might not be soccer enthusiasts, but how they're affected by it or even how soccer that their team can be affected by just the community itself. And so that kind of sparked the idea maybe like a year ago. And I was like, that would be really awesome to do. I just have no idea how I would ever do it. And this is me trying. And so I started working with Chicago, not working with, but doing my project for Chicago House. And I've gone there. I've gone to like four games now because they're a lot closer to me. I've gotten to know 
their coaches, the front office and, and the players and just some of the Chicago soccer staples. And it's so great. Like their hearts are in the right place. And it's amazing to see people who say that they want to be part of the community and actually follow through with it. And I think yeah. both of those organizations are doing a great job. Yeah. Thank you for saying all of that. And that's awesome <laughs> that what you're doing. I mean, you're again, yeah. you're yeah. an initiator. You just create it. You're like, okay, this, if I want to, you're empathic towards yourself too. You know what it yeah. is you're feeling and then you try to act on it. I mean, not just try, but you are. You are. Yeah. You have a vision, idea, and then you act on it. So I think that's really inspiring. I mean, a lot of people who are listening would probably be inspired by that. Women, young women, women of color, just anyone would be inspired by that. I mean, how many people, I don't know, maybe a lot of women just get on the plane and fly across country to Oakland and hang out for life by themselves. <laughs> Everyone does it. I mean, I guess, I guess. But you traveled alone, but you weren't alone in the process. Like we, right. we hung out, like you met so many other folks at The Roots. You did a great little segment on your experience, which was super creative and cool to watch. I think that community-based... I mean, for you to find value in that and think that's amazing is also, I don't think everyone would. Like, soccer yeah. is about making money. Soccer is about winning. Who cares about the community? But yeah. there are so many messages that we've gotten at the Oakland Roots around, like, you know, especially around the pandemic, that the Roots gave them something to believe in. Yeah. Especially in a town like Oakland, California, where there has been lots of times where there was a lack of belief. Not in ourselves, but others not believing in us. And I think yeah. that's also a manifestation of this season with the roots, like believing in themselves. No one, Oakland believes in them. Oakland will always yeah. believe in them. Yeah. But I mean, both teams actually mirrored each other. I spoke with Madrid and then Peter Welt with Chicago House, and they both said, We are available and inclusive to everyone, but we're not necessarily for everybody because not everyone wants to stand by this. Not everyone is supportive exactly. enough or strong enough or cares. And we've seen plenty of that, you know, just really soccer, you know, don't talk about anything else. Just, yeah, just stick to the sport. You're here for my entertainment, you know, and there's exactly. plenty of those people and they're like, we don't want those people yep. coming to the games. And I support that. You get quality over quantity is important. Yes. Well, it goes to that big narrative to of athletes are just there for your entertainment just to perform mm -hmm. and don't have their own yeah. lives. Like the whole shut up and dribble situation and like, just do what yeah. we're paying you to do. We're not paying you to have thoughts on social inequities or racial inequities. We're not paying you to have those individual thoughts. Although you might be someone who has felt socially unjust or felt like there have been racial inequities coming in your direction. It's just so interesting. More yeah. than interesting, but again, we could have a whole nother interview on it. But I think that yeah. recognizing and your manifestation of that too, you are more than your sport, more than who you are on the field. And you're expressing that. You have creativity, vision, you're relationship oriented. I think it's really cool. I mean, if you were to look back and if there are any parents listening or young girls listening, like what advice or like reflections or insight would you want to share for any young girls coming up in soccer and or any young girls of color coming up and navigating their identity through that? Anything there that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think right now what, what we're seeing, not as positive of a light, but we're seeing a lot of negative relationships with coaches, owners, and the players and the females not being treated very well. And I actually had to have my first conversation with a couple of girls that I train. They are 14 and 12 now, I think. But just speak up. It's scary. Like You might not realize some of the things that are going on. They might not seem that bad, but just be mindful of your surroundings. If anyone makes you feel uncomfortable in any sort of capacity, your mom is she was standing with me. Like She's very open. You got to be able to talk to her. You can talk to me. Or just find someone that you can speak to about what's happening because mm -hmm. it's not okay. And you should mm -hmm. never feel like you should never feel like that you've done something to deserve it or that if it does happen to you that you're not good enough to get past something like that or to bypass you. So that's huge. And I do wish more people were at least having that conversation on how to be open and who to go to. And then I think with the sport specifically, 
girls are so afraid to be wrong. Like we're not allowed to be class clowns in the classroom. We're not allowed mm-hmm. to, you know, we're not allowed to act out and be unladylike. And we're not allowed to try things on the field because we feel like we have to do it exactly as the drill is instructed. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do pattern play. It's going to be beautiful, but we don't necessarily know how to read the game as well. Because boys, they'll play one-on-one. They try their tricks. They do everything. So I would definitely say that there needs to be, whether it's the team that they play for or some place they can go to just try and not necessarily worry about being wrong. There is a time and a place to do things correctly and as the coach asks, but we just think very differently because sometimes you can tell guys like, hey, just do this and then you're going to adjust this and this and like, okay, got it. And it makes sense to them. And for girls, if you don't say, this is why we do it, they're going to do it for the purpose of the drill and they're not going to apply it to the game. They're not going to understand, oh, I'm turning away and checking back because I'm trying to lose my defender. They just think it's just a part of the drill to keep it different. I've watched a lot of male coaches coach girls and they don't know. They don't know how we operate. So it's to no fault of them. But I would love to see more environments where girls feel more free to make mistakes and just try and get to express themselves a little bit more. I don't know. I guess even parents too, there has to be, I think, a setting for, especially if you are an athlete and you want your kids to be super athletes, or even if you're not, you just want them to be so good at it. We all do, right? Everyone wants their kids to be the next best thing. But they kind of have to get to that point of wanting to be in sports themselves, like giving them the opportunity to be themselves and to find out what they're good at, not just be told what they should be good at. And so kind of more of the parents, that's what I hope happens as well. Because if you feel like you can't truly express yourself, you're not going to be as good anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think that parlays into the mental health, which you probably experience as well too. But and again, that could also be a whole nother thing. But like, you know, athletes aren't allowed to express themselves a lot of times. And if you do, you get in trouble. And so if you're harnessing all of these feelings, you're not going to be at your best. Absolutely. Those are awesome, awesome reflections and insights. I mean, lots of gems there for everyone to take from someone who's lived it, going through it. I mean, the takeaways, I think in summary, what I'm hoping I'm, you're saying, and I want to summarize for everyone as bullet points is like, as athletes, like find your voice and use it. Don't be afraid. Know who your support team is behind you. Yeah. Like know who you can go to. That there's a difference between how girls and boys operate on the field. And I think in any situation, I mean, your example of the drill and knowing it for the drill's purpose, but not fully understanding how it can be applied to the game is Mm -hmm. definitely something that goes on. Like my daughter's 14 and she plays softball, high level softball. And so it's not until she understands why she's asked to do something that she will then fully embrace it and do it. She will do it because you asked her to because she respects elders and she wants to follow directions and Mm -hmm. be coachable and all that. She'll do it, but it won't land deep and like be applied. And then she can be creative within it until she understands fully. So I think that's huge. That's huge. She's also, yeah, will want to do it right the first time and be Mm -hmm. down on herself if she can't. So that space is to try, to be creative, to make mistakes so we can learn, you know, Mm -hmm. to just be free to be yourself is so important. I think you're speaking to coaching development. Like they don't know what they don't know, but like, here's an ask. Like, let's have them know. Let's have them learn. Let's have them Mm -hmm. understand childhood development and the difference between genders and how to communicate to the athlete, not just a cookie cutter approach to anyone. So I know you can, you're vibing with that and that's what you were saying. I think I am a parent. So I know the piece about like, I don't care if she's the next best thing. I want you to have fun, be kind to yourself and others and play. Like when she comes home from a tournament or a game or a training session, like, did you have fun? What is something new you learned about yourself? Mm -hmm. Because you and I both know the sport only lasts so long. There's not a lot of venues for females to play professionally in their sports. Mm -hmm. That's growing. And some people don't want to. They just want to be good. I mean, it's so important. I think I found in my work that sometimes, like you said, whether the parent's an an athlete or not, that they sometimes want to live through their child and don't even really realize it. 
yep. and push them to achieve or perform at a certain level that they never got to for whatever reason. And then it yeah. is about the parent, right? It's not about tuning into the child and what they want. Yeah. So like you said, it leads into decline in mental health when you can't express yourself. Yeah. So emotions unexpressed become a weight. They can become physical manifestations of injury. Your mental yeah. health is injured, right? So speaking of that, like, what are your views on mental health, specifically athlete mental health? I mean, you've just laid out like a recipe or formula for all of us to think about. And then now segue into mental health. But like, what are your views on it? Any thoughts that you have, I think would be valuable for us to hear and talk about. Yeah, I actually echo you in that. I hope that every team, every organization eventually does have a specialist or, or someone that is there for the purpose of supporting the athletes. Like I said, I didn't really understand everything about my own experiences until I was much older, which I think is common. But I cannot think of people that I really had to go to if I was frustrated about something, especially when you're younger, because you kind of feel like some of your frustrations are not that important or not that... Maybe they're not important, but they're not that deep. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because it's like, well, you know, I'm getting to play the sport that I love or I am around a lot of positive things. It's just this one, this one little thing. It's really not that bad compared to others. So you kind of push it to the side, you know, and the Haiti coach would always ask before practice, before a game, does anyone not feel 100%? Does anyone not feel like they're ready to play? Which at first I was like, wow, that's, that's the first time I've been asked that. You know, for someone to actually give us the opportunity. However, I didn't really feel confident that if you did say yes, that you would be treated correctly or that, like, right. You know, may you get just looked over the right. next few times, just kind of like, all right, well, don't come to practice. Almost like a negative thing. And I think the lack of expressing vulnerability happens more in, in men's sports because mm -hmm. whoever decided that being vulnerable is like unmanly, right? Is it masculine? I don't know who decided that, but it's ruined everybody. But they can't, they can't be sad at all. They can't grieve death of a relative friend or whoever. They can't do it because they're, they're just seen by other people who don't matter as negative. And, you know, I think it was Skip Bayless, I think, who said when Dak Prescott in the pandemic was going through that and saying he wasn't a leader. Because he was letting his vulnerability right. show. And to everyone else, right. like, no, right. more of that. More of that. And exactly. it's sad that a lot of male athletes have to go through that. And I think female athletes were expected to be more emotional, but were not necessarily given the positive environment to do so. But one time a month where you have to deal with things a little bit differently. And we might spout off or we might not feel good enough to play those sorts of things, they're looked at with a little bit of disgust mm -hmm. instead of like mm -hmm. something we can't control. It's natural. And we have to start feeling kind of gross about ourselves. Right. Which is sad. Yeah. I mean, I want more for everybody. I do want more for everybody there. Because like I said, I think of how many people don't perform at their best or don't perform well because of something that they have to keep hidden. Yes. And we saw with Simone Biles and yeah. Shikari Richardson, we saw mm -hmm. that when you're not given proper outlets and you just make your own decision for it, everyone's going to look at you and say, well, why, you know, Shikari Richardson, like everyone was mad at her for choosing marijuana to deal with what she needed to deal with. It's like, that was a pretty safe route and something that shouldn't really have affected anything and the outcome of anything else. But she probably didn't know what else to do. And it's exactly. easy for other people to, to say, oh, well, she just should have talked to someone about it. Well, maybe she didn't know who to talk to. Right. She's a high level, high performing athlete. And you, sometimes your experiences are not easily relatable. Right. No, thank you for all that. So important. I mean, if we stay with Shakari Richardson for a little longer, I mean, like, I think that being young, vocal, big personality, Black woman is also sort of like, oh, well, it makes sense that she would go to weed. Like, quote unquote, that's what they all do. Yeah. Mm. And that just that stereotype. And like you're saying, I agree, like 
Does she have access or know of other outlets to take care of her mental health? That's what she's known. And who can she trust? Right? I mean, I think she was dealing with grief, you know, her bio mother passing away in the middle of training. I think that if I'm not mistaken, the USOPC is actually working to shift and recognize that their rules about certain traditionally banned substances is an archaic approach. Yeah. And they're trying to shift that and make it more relevant to current society. And the current laws and rules of everyday society is different. Mm -hmm. Marijuana weed is legal in some states. And she was so desperate. She knew the consequence, but she didn't know any other way to deal. Yeah. And that's sad. Yeah. That also shows how intense it could be. Because like you said, she's in the middle of training and not just, but also like at the highest level and performance that she's probably ever going to do. That's like the peak for an athlete. And she's on edge. Even if you are seasoned and experienced and so headstrong, like even if you're all of those things, there's still going to be some form of uncertainty. You still get, I still get like, I'll be playing in some like recreational tournament. Like even before you step on the field, you still feel a little bit of butterflies. You still just yeah. like have mm-hmm. those nerves, even if it's like, this doesn't mean anything. This is for fun, but you still just kind of have that. So like the expectations people put on, onto athletes is so high. You know, LeBron will score 20 points instead of 40 and everyone jumps down him. Like why? Like right. he was so bad. And it's like, no one comes to people at their jobs and, you know, says, well, you didn't perform as well today. Like you just, I mean, that's right. You know, like, and no one asks like, and this is a little bit, this is a little bit off topic, but it just reminded me of it. But sometimes when you explain to someone that you play a sport and they ask what you do and you know, I play a sport, they're like, oh, are you good? (laughs) I guess. Like, what do you do? You're counting. Are you good? Like no one says those things to that, but like when you say you're an athlete, there's almost like, oh, but like, that's great what point. To say? Oh my God. I just started saying yes, because I mean, I don't know what they expect, but also like, yes, that is my job. Exactly. But like, then it makes you feel weird. Like, why? Yeah. No, that's not off topic. I mean, that is part of how athletes have to navigate the stressors around them that impact their mm-hmm. mental health. So finding ways to respond, finding tools and skills to exercise, to emotion regulate, to like just take it as a grain of salt. They don't know what they're saying and not take it personally is a yeah. practice, a daily practice. Yeah. And it's, it's not easy. Just like any practice that we need to benefit ourselves and help ourselves stay positive and healthy. So that's definitely not off topic. I mean, what I found too is like, oh, you play such and such. You just had a game. Did you win? There's always that question. Did yeah. you win? Yeah. It's yeah. like, wow. Like, yeah. But, if you say no, they're like, know, oh. Then you must so. <laughs> <Okay. ugh." laughs> yeah. They just like don't know what to say after that. They're like, well, you can't always win everything. No. So, well, sometimes it happens. Yeah. And then it's like that awkward pause where they like wait for you to like defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah. For their entertainment, right. again, to see you squirm. It's just so (laughs) weird. But I think that our conversation, like today, the many conversations that we've had that I know we will have are shifting this paradigm, shifting the culture of how we talk about athlete identity, how we talk about athlete mental health, what's healthy to talk about all the way around because mental health impacts physical health and vice versa. And the holistic connection, like just bringing more and more awareness and information to people is super important. You know, I really, really appreciate you being here. It's super valuable. Yeah. I know I was asking a lot of questions. Is there (laughs) anything that you want to make sure you say today? Like the mic is yours. Anything you want to add or say or share with us would be awesome. If anything. Yeah, I guess kind of what we were just finishing with just the general appreciation or even acknowledgement that athletes who are, I guess I'll say professional athletes or anyone who is doing it as a big part of their well-being, their jobs, whatever, that it is in fact a job. And Mm. we are putting in the same amount of efforts. It's usually more physical, but equally as mental 
And it's just because we're not showing up, you know, nine to five doesn't mean that we're not working. Cause I did have that even when I was in Chile, like I'd have an hour and a half of practice and you kind of have the rest of the day off technically. But like sometimes you tell people like, oh, I'm just kind of tired or they're like, well, you don't really work. That's like, oh, well, so. I do. Yeah, I do. And I also have to be so on. And I also have been in an office setting and I don't want to discount those types of careers. But I just, I just mean that we still have to put in a lot and we're performing more than we're not. Yeah. Because every time you show up to practice, you can't just show up and go through the motions. Yeah. You can go to an office sometimes and kind of check things off if you want and just kind of go and you go clock your hours. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. You have to be on, especially games. You have to go above and beyond regardless of what you're going through. You have to do it. Yeah. And so I do just hope that there is a little bit more empathy around, around athletes and their training and what it takes for them. Mentally demanding, physically demanding. Otherwise, I don't know. I guess to the female athletes, we got to ride this momentum right now. There's a lot of positives happening. We're seeing a lot of negative, but there are so many positives happening with people getting a voice, whether they're covering men's sports, whether they're getting coaching roles in men's or women's mm-hmm. sports, whether they're just getting to try being an athlete, like whichever capacity and realm that you're in, we've got to push forward and we've got to do it together. I think we also have to allow men to support us mm. as well. And kind of sounds weird to say that we have to allow them, like it's not a competition. Mm-hmm. You know, we shouldn't combat it and say like, well, men don't understand, but help them understand, you know, just as we've kind of always done for them. So, you know, working together with them, but also females got to stick together. We got to support each other. I really appreciate it. Super important points. I mean, you're talking about allyship and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So yes, and I'm proud to be alongside you in female visibility and representation and I look forward to many, many more conversations with you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. One of my favorite things about our Sportsypreneur content platform is the opportunity to chat with amazing people in and around the world of sports. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you want to connect more, hit us up on Instagram at Sportsypreneur. Thank you for listening to this CadSource production, the Sportsypreneur podcast, the podcast where sports and entrepreneurship collide. Sportsypreneur is a content platform, a collaborative team, and a marketing brand that is all about showcasing leaders and difference makers in and around the world of sports. When we create our own content, we also create content with you. This includes collaborative content and exclusive content for your brand. Think podcasts, blogs, social media, and overall content strategy. Our sports content marketing team is specifically niche for those in the sports industry. That includes sports businesses, athletes, managers, coaches, trainers, entrepreneurs, and business leaders in the sports market. The bottom line is we want to help with your sports-related brand, your content marketing, and your story. Connect with us on Instagram at sportsepreneur or find us online at sportsepreneur.com. Sportsepreneur, the content platform where sports and entrepreneurship collide.